Hey, Travels with Dottie here, and this is a really special video for me. Um, it's about how I name my channel, and it's about my dad. Now, I named my channel Travels with Dottie, and that was an homage to John Steinbeck's book, Travels with Charlie. John Steinbeck um, did an autobiographical book about a time where he decided, you know what? Um, I want a pickup truck with a camper on the back and I wanna take my dog and I wanna travel across the whole country and I wanna take months to do it. And his wife agreed and said, you wanna go do that, you go do it. And he did and he wrote a book about it and it was fabulous. And it also happened to be my dad's favorite book and somewhere around 1966 or so, um, something happened with my dad that I didn't understand back then, but as an adult, I figured it out. Um, he took me, I think it was a car dealership, if I'm not mistaken. And on the lot of that car dealership, was a pickup truck with a camper on it that looked just like John Steinbeck's. And that was kind of the era. It was a few years after John Steinbeck did it, but it was the same era. And the salesperson uh, showed us the camper. And I'm a, like a six-year-old kid. And I climb up into the back of this pickup truck and there's a home there. There's a house. It looked enormous to me. And it was one of the most exciting things that I have ever seen. And uh, I realized as an adult, this was my dad sort of putting his toe in the water and looking a little bit about the obvious dream that he had um, to do what St John Steinbeck did. And he never did. And he had, uh, he had five reasons to not do them. And here they are. This is uh, a, a picture. I think I was in my early 30s or so in this picture. And this is um, uh, starting as you're looking at the picture all the way on the left hand side. That's my, that's my niece, um, Ptolemy. Um, but everyone else other than my father in the center are my brothers and sisters, my brother Frank and my sisters, uh, Anne and Margaret and my brother Tad. Uh, I'm the youngest by 10 years. And then there's 10 years older than me is Margaret, 12 years older is Annie, 13 years older is Frank, and 17 years older is Tad. And um, when he was looking at this camper, he either had most of these kids in college. I think most of them, I think Margaret was... Um, Margaret and Ann maybe were still in high school, but they were about to go into college and he was paying for everything. So there's probably no way he could afford to buy this thing um, and um, do what he wanted to do because he, uh, you know, what came first for my dad was his family. And he proved that to us over and over again. And I'm going to take the rest of this video to talk about a couple of things that I think are really extraordinary about my dad. He was part of the greatest generation. He was um, uh, active in World War II. He was in the Army Air Corps, which is the predecessor to the United States Air Force. And he was uh, a navigator. Um, he ended up uh, first a lieutenant, then a captain, a navigator on a bomber. I believe first uh, initially a B-25, but through most of his career, a B-26 out of like New Guinea in the South Pacific. And dad didn't, when dad talked about the war, he'd said, ah, and I was, we were in the back waters of the war. There wasn't much going on. And he made it sound like, you no, know, he didn't really see much action. It was kind of boring. Um, but that's not just like my dad. That's like many of the people from that era. We found out from our grandmother um, that he was, he was a hero. And he was a hero for um, specific reasons. And uh, from my grandmother, we got a copy of this um, newspaper article. And I'm going to read it to you. 
Jersey Navigator wins air medal, alternating um, between firing the tail guns and navigating a United States Army Air Forces Navigator kept 25 Japanese Zero fighter planes at bay from the rear of a Martin B-26 Marauder until the medium bomber had reached its base safely in the southwest Pacific area, the War Department has informed. Second Lieutenant Frank H. Wakeley, South Orange, New Jersey, was the navigator who doubled in these vital operations during the air battle, which began after the marauder had bombed an enemy convoy near Lay Harbor in New Guinea. Before the Japanese fighter attacked, the tail gunner became ill. Lieutenant Wakeley gathered his maps and as much as his other navigation equipment as he could carry along the narrow walk through the fuselage. He left his compartment in the forward part of the plane and started toward the tail. His passage was made hazardous because the bomb bay doors were open and could not be closed. Edging around the opening, he, he gained the tail turret position. Lieutenant Wakeley then plunged into a whirlwind of action. He gave aid to the sick gunner. He charted the course of the plane, giving directions to the pilot over the inter interphone. He fired his guns with such accuracy that the Japanese were unable to press home a successful attack from the rear on the B-26. For this action, the Air Medal has been awarded to Lieutenant Wakeley. Um, just amazing. And here's the Air Medal. And there's also next to it, a distinguished flying cross. And to this day, we don't know what he did for that second medal. Um, I had, um, there's a way that you can request military records. And I went through that whole process and I heard back and the military informed, unfortunately, that those records had been destroyed in a fire and there was no way to retrieve them. So we'll never know what act of heroism my dad engaged in um, for that second medal. Uh, pretty extraordinary. Um, my dad, um, he was a war hero and he was a great dad. He wasn't a perfect dad. Um, another story I'm about to tell you um, makes him sound perfect because um, there were, this was an extraordinary thing about my father. Um, but I, I, if, if you're a father or about to be a father or are making comparisons, understand my dad was not perfect. But my dad had perfect things about his character. There were parts of my dad that were perfect. And as I'm talking here, I'm planning on showing various pictures of my dad when he was a young man. Boy, was he handsome, huh? And um, there's one or two pictures of him um, uh, not long before he passed. He passed at um, uh, 83. And I'm going to tell you um, a story. It's actually two stories in one about my dad's... Um, about my dad's passing, um, he and my stepmother had a uh, a summer home in northern New Hampshire, and uh, my dad was 83 and a half. I think I was 42, and I was on a business trip, and I got a call from one of my sisters saying, uh, "Dad has pneumonia. He's in the hospital, and um, we think he's days away from death. You need to come." And we all converged on this little hospital in um, Laconia, New Hampshire. And I was the last one to arrive on a Friday night. Um, there, was, um, there were flight delays. There was a lot of storming. I wasn't sure if I could get there. And I finally arrived. And everyone was in the hospital room with him. And he was kind of semi-conscious. And he was... As it turns out, he was within 24 hours of his death. Um, but very clearly, he looked up and saw me. And uh, <clears throat> sorry. Wow, this is over. This was uh, over 20 years ago. Um, 
He said, there is my baby boy. And uh, I stayed there um, with my brothers and sisters over the next 24 hours. And uh, he was less and less communicative after that. Uh, it's the, there's my baby boy is the last really coherent thing that um, I remember him saying. And uh, that night, um, um, everybody else had been there for longer and they were tired and they had a hotel room and everyone left late in the evening to go to the hotel to get rest. And, uh, I was there with my older brother, Frank, and, uh, we stayed the whole night with my dad and he, he, my dad needed something. Um, and it's not important what he needed, but, I said, I looked at my brother and he, and, uh, I said, I'll go get the nurse. And my brother says, no, no, um, we're going to take care of him tonight. And we took care of that matter with my dad. And I was a little nervous about it. I thought, Hey, doesn't a nurse have to be in there for this? But it was important that we took care of our dad that last night. And I'm so grateful <clears throat> to my older brother for, um, having that thought and, and that we did that and took care of him that night. Um, the, the night passed and during that next day on Saturday, um, it was a vigil of watching my dad laying on his back, breathing irregularly. Um, and that went into the evening that night where, um, you know, I don't know if you've watched anyone die like this, but there's like a breath and then a long period and you're on the edge of your seat thinking, was that the last breath? Then I'll take another one. And that went on for quite some time. He, towards the end, he was on a, one of those oxygen masks and this, the doctor, a woman, um, it is more emotional than I thought it was going to be, but it's important. It's important to talk about this. She came in and uh, we're all, his kids were all around him. And the only private possession that he had was that picture I showed you of all of us together. And I'll, I'll, I'll show that again here. And it was on the nightstand and that's the only possession he had there. And she took the oxygen mask off of him. And he said, she goes, there's not really a good reason for this anymore. And she got close to his ear and she said, Frank, it's my dad's name, Frank Wakely. All your children are here. It's okay to go. Um, what a uh, kind thing for her to say. And uh, we sat in a circle. I think I was next to my brother. My brother was holding my dad's hand. I was holding my brother's and I went around to the other side, holding my, my uh, in a circle, holding my dad's hand. And he was on his back. He wasn't conscious, but he was breathing. And we sat like that for at least probably an hour. And uh, we were quiet. And suddenly his, his back arches and he takes in a deep breath and he exhales. And I see all I could describe as a vaporous light shooting out of his mouth and straight up through the ceiling. And I jumped up and I yelled, did you see that? And pandemonium broke out because we all knew that he had died. That was the moment. It, it just, we knew it was the moment that he died. Um, so I can tell you this. I know I saw my dad's soul leave his body. I don't pretend to know where the soul goes. I don't pretend to know anything about that. I know what, I know that was my dad. 
leaving the body. And that's all I know for sure. And it was a um, moment that is indelibly imprinted and is part of me. And I can relive it any moment I want in detail. So a couple of days later, um, well, maybe not a couple of days, but later we all gathered. Um, it wasn't a couple of days later because that's where this, this was in um, New York. We, we regathered together after his death. And he didn't want a funeral. There wasn't a memorial, a memorial service. He was cremated and um, he was buried next to the ashes were part of the ashes. I don't even know, you know what? Now that I'm saying this, I don't know if there are any ashes there or not. There was a tombstone next to my mother in upstate New York. And uh, my brothers and sisters and I all gathered together there. And um, there was no plan. And what happened was that my brother pulled a letter out of his pocket and he read it. Now, give you a little background that you need to know for this letter to make sense. Let me, give me a second and I will pull the letter up here. And the date of this letter was June 7th, 1968. And that's when my uh, brother had graduated from Bucknell University in Pennsylvania with a civil engineering degree. And he was, he got a job in New York City. You'll never believe where he, he got a job as the assistant to the general contractor on the World Trade Center. That's where he was going. And he pulls this letter out. And um, he reads it, June 7th, 1968. Dear Frank, and my brother's name is also Frank. He's Frank Jr. It was Shakespeare who once said, all the world's a stage, and then went on to liken man's life to a play with its formal division of acts, scenes, etc. This analogy is, and always will be appropriate and is readily applicable to the lives of each one of us. Each day of one's life is full of subtle changes, most of which we accept unconsciously without recognition. But every now and then, events occur which have a sense of finality about them. They make the curtain fall and conclude a well-defined act in a person's life. Your recent graduation and imminent departure from New York City are such events. They signal the close of one big act in your life and the commencement of another. The cord of de dependency, which has linked you to home, and which I hope has not been too onerous, is being severed. You go out to face the world now as your own man completely. Um, this milestone, which you have just reached, makes me think of a lot of things past, present, and future. It is at a time like this which awakens within the father, within a father, the urge to dispense paternal advice. I shall resist that urge and simply tell you whatever wisdom I might possess will always be yours for the asking. Beyond that, I will suggest only that, in my humble opinion, consideration of others, epitomized, epitomized by the unselfish act and self-integrity, honesty to oneself and to others are the two prime qualities that make the man. As a boy and as a young man, you have been everything a father could ask for. You are a real credit to your family as well to those others who have influenced your life and your character. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you will always have my unwavering support and love. I naturally hope that the ties between you and your brothers and sisters will remain intact and that you all stand together when the occasion calls for such unity. 
This all sounds like a last farewell, but it definitely is not that. I have written only in recognition that an important chapter of your life is closed and a new one is beginning. May God bless you and travel with you as you walk into the future with affection, Dad. Um, that was it. He read that. And we, as a group, we turned and walked away and headed back to the cars and, and, uh, and went home. There was nothing, nothing more to say. These words, as beautiful as they are, are made even more remarkable by my knowledge and the knowledge I share with my brothers and sisters that he lived these words with all of us as a father. He lived these words with rare exception. And I say rare exception because I hate speaking in absolutes. There are probably exceptions. I don't know of any. My brothers and sisters all grew up in the 60s. You can imagine the turmoil and the questionable, questionable decisions we all made. All right. And how he was in fear for us often. He did not come to us with unsolicited advice, but we always knew that he was there with advice for the asking. And I asked quite a bit and I got great advice from him. Um, he stuck and lived to these words and there was no doubt And ask any one of my brothers and sisters, did you ever feel like dad didn't have your back? And the answer is no. Um, I said my dad wasn't perfect. This is a perfect letter. And that part of my dad that he that's described in this letter, parts of that were perfect. Um, my brother and I talked about this the other night. And uh, I also talk, he has two boys of his own. I talked to one of his boys recently about this too. And uh, when they graduated from college, they were handed a copy of this letter with a note from my brother saying, I, I don't have words better than this. Um, so Travels with Dottie is an honor of this man. Um, and, uh, I wanted the world to hear it. I wanted to, to, to put this out there and, um, I hope you got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, take care. Thank you.